Okay. Yeah. Uh. Okay, hi, we, we're almost there, almost time for lunch, so I'll try to keep this short so people won't get grumpy and impatient and everything, but um, we'll see. So, uh, so today I'm going to present uh, HoloGAN, which is a GAN network that learns a free representation directly from natural images. Um, so even if you never heard about GAN until today, I'm sure you have heard enough about GAN until now. Uh, because these models have been everywhere uh, very recently because they keep producing very, very impressive images uh, every, six, every six months, every deadline, basically there's a new GAN model that's trying to make it more realistic and with high resolution every six months. Um, and you know, then you, you go to Twitter and people are like, oh my gosh, like all of this GAN is gonna be deep fakes and everything. Uh, but the thing is, these models right now, uh, what you can do is that you generate really pretty images out, like really realistic, like, but you basically have no control over what you can generate. So if you're an artist or if you want to do it more than uh, use these models for any things more than just pretty images, it starts to get very non-trivial. Um, if you want to control uh, the images that you're generating, you basically need some labels during training. So here, for example, in this work, they show that they can control um, the pose of the faces that you're generating, like in this guy, so you can have the same face but rotating in different uh, direction. But to train this model, you basically have to pair uh, the image with the corresponding pose during training so that the model can learn this correlation between pose information and image information. Um, unsupervised method, as in during training, the model only sees images without using any pose information, like here in Fogan, uh, is still quite uh, struggling with a few things. A, um, they only work with like very simple data, which in this case like synthetic data set with like a white background. And B, as you can see in this case, as the model tries to rotate these chairs, it starts to show a lot of artifacts uh, and starts to get some blurry um, and extra like extra noises in there. Um, so you either need labels, or if you don't right now, you don't really have good quality gem images that you have compared to the unsupervised uh, non-label models. So we propose Hologan, which means now that uh, it's still an unsupervised model, so now instead of, in addition to generating nice pictures, um, you can also now control the poses of the images that you're generating. And um, now instead of the, in addition again, instead of just images, you can now control the color or the appearance of the images that you do uh, that you're getting. The thing, the trick is, we do all of this without using any labels. As in, we're training these networks using only images. We don't have any motive views. We don't have any pair that said we only have a random collection of images. So, so this is a normal conditional GAN, right? So here you have some noise vector Z get into a generator. If you want to control it, you have some uh, extra input theta, which may be pose, for example, but you give it to the generator and it works so you can get an image of this pose out. However, during training, as I've said, you also have to give this pose information to the discriminator. So the discriminator can learn to tell the difference between the image at this pose compared to the image in a different pose. So in Hall again, we have the same thing in a way that for the generator, we can also now have some input, which is a pose information that controls the pose of the object in the image. But during training, the, the discriminator still only see images. They don't see any pose labels. That's why we can train this network without seeing any extra information apart from just images. And the way that we do it is that we go back to the drawing board and thinking about the design of the architecture network. Um, I use to study architecture, like building, so I quite like this joke. Um, but basically, to be more precise, we, the whole point of Hologan is to adding some inductive biases about the 3D world and how the image that we see is formed from this real world into this CNN architecture. So if you're familiar with GAN, so there tons of them, obviously, uh, but they have the same kind of flavor in the sense that you have some noise vector, you sample, and then you have a series of convolution neural network that trying to learn some features, and finally you got the image out. And you see this thing over and over again, ranging from this engine model from 2014, 
to the latest one, which is the Zhao Gan, which is 2019. Still, you, have, you can stack extra layers, you can stack extra normalization, but it's still the same thing. You use convolu 2D convolutions to generate the images. What we do differently in Holagan is that, if this works, that doesn't work, um, is you still have the noise vector, right? So instead of uh, feeding this noise into some 2D convolution, these green guys here, like all the GANs model, we actually first force the model to learn some 3D representation, which is the orange block here. And then we transform it to a desired pose. And then we render it with rejection unit to 2D features and again got the image out. So if you are familiar with 3D modeling or computer graphics, that starts to sound like, like rendering. Like you do some 3D modeling and you render that to get the image. Um, so we train this whole network end to end. So, um, so during training, because we don't know any post label, we just randomly sample this post. So we just randomly rotate these features during training. And during test time, you can give the desired post to this part, and then you can get the image at that post out. Um, the other thing is that in order to bridge between these 3D parts and these 2D parts, there must be some uh, projection part uh, step going on. So here, in theory, you can use some differentiable renderer to bridge this gap. Um, but here, we chose to learn the rendering step as well, because it gives us a lot of extra um, flexibility to do with any data set. So if you follow the literature, the current differential renderers are quite limiting and lots of sense. Um, for example, they can only um, try to approximate a um, rasterization process, so you cannot try to get any realistic images out and things like that. So here we chose to learn this directly instead of having a handcrafted differential renderer. Um, I should have got that one by one, but you've seen that by now. Um, and the projection unit is just an MOP that learns to select which features should be seen from a certain angle. Um, so to train this network, um, we basically uh, just use a normal GAN loss, so whether the image, the final image is out, is real or fake, because we don't have any other labels. We have some other uh, regularizer, but I will, um, I can go into more details later, but I'll skip that for now. But the main loss is just still a normal GAN loss, whether the image is real or fake. Um, and because within this model we don't make any assumption about the shape, we don't have any uh, symmetry prior or smoothness prior or any shape template, we can apply the same model on a variety of data sets, ranging from some synthetic data set to a more realistic scene setup. It would be exactly the same model architecture. We don't make any extra assumptions. Um, so the first one is a uh, phase. So here we sample, so for every single image, we sample a different Z, a different noise, and then we just apply the same post for every single image on the, um, in every rows and columns. So now, as you can see, instead of just generating face images, you can now actually control the poses of the faces that you get. Uh, same thing with chairs, which is now already a bit more difficult because in chairs you have a lot more variety in the geometry and colors, and here you can still control in terms of both azimuth and elevation. Um, a bit more difficult, cats. So cats has a lot more texture. Uh, it's still a face, but it has a lot more texture and more, more colors going on. Um, setup A, um, which is the data set for GAN, I guess. And a fun thing here is that if you look at all of this face, although the facing are rotating, the eyes are keep looking at the camera. And that's because in the data set, celebrities tend to look at camera when they take photos. Um, so that's a fun fact. Um, so the next thing is cars. So car is a very challenging data set because you have lots of background going on, you have lighting, you have shadows, you have specularity, you have lots of things going on. And again, we use exactly the same model. Um, without any post labels in terms of the rotation of the car, and we, still, we now can um, generate cars in any direction that we want. So that's pose and a, a pose and object. We can also separate the um, appearance and the object in the scene. So what we did is that we sampled two noise vector. One we fit into the 3D features part, and one we fit into the 2D features part. And so here, for example, is a series of face and cars. And what we, what we show here is that by keeping Z1 the same, which is the red box here, and just changing different Z2, 
you can have exactly the same shape but with different colors and appearance. Here, and the model here knows nothing about albedo or normal map or anything, but it can still learn to separate these two. Um, so this is just more a result, so it's working not only on faces, but cars and also bedroom data set, which is quite complicated data set to work on. But when we work on this project, I think the thing that excites me most about is that in order to do all of this separation between pose and objects and appearance, the model basically learned a 3D representation of the world of the day from the data set that it was trained on. Um, so the model here, for example, for the car data set, it learns some free representation of cars, although it's never seen a cars before, like what this looks like in terms of geometry, it's never seen anything like that before. So um, how, is this, how does this method compare with methods that use explicit geometry of cars? So during training the model, what if uh, the model can see cars? So we, we compare our work with this work, the visual object network, where it's still again, so the final uh, goal is to generate images of cars, but here, from a noise vector, they first explicitly generate a 3D shape, which is a voxel grid, a binary voxel grid, and then they render them into a depth map and a silhouette map, and then do a pix to pix kind of framework to colorize this in the end. So during training, the model does see cars geometry. So this is the result from uh, the visual object network, so, so you can see that although the network have seen cars, shapes, or geometry before, it still struggles to, to generate some images at certain poses, so like this guy or this guy or that guy, and this method can only work with images without any background or shadows or anything, so it's a much more simple problem compared to our method where the model not only learn the variety of poles without seeing any cars geometry before. It also deal with the background and generate realistic shadows and lighting effects coming out. Um, and an interesting thing to note here is that the voxel grid that this guy used here is a binary voxel grid of 128 resolution, so that's quite big, and then they have a whole network later on to do the coloring, while for um, Hologan, the 3D representation is a cube of 16 resolution, so it's quite sparse, with 64 channels. So it's a much sparser, much, but much more expressive kind of representation compared to like this explicit voxel grid representation. So here is a turntable result in a way. So although, so this is from Vaughn. Um, so although they have seen cars geometry before during training, they, this method really struggles to generate cars from the back view, so if you can see it just generating from like a frontal 0 to 180 kind of degree, while our method, although never seen cars before, can fully recover the 360 poles with addition of generating realistic background and shadows and things like that. And this thing really uh, excites me personally because if we start thinking about um, being able to learn a more uh, expressive free representation um, when we move to more complex things like scenes, which is a bit now become more tricky to how to model meshes for scenes or how can you even compactly represent them with texture mapping and lighting and ray tracing and everything on top, um, I think there's something interesting to, to, to explore here. And here is the final results where we take the same model and apply it on the Elson bedroom data set. So this data set is super complicated because A, you have so many objects within the scene and again, lots of different lighting effects. And here, uh, although it's a complex thing, we still only use the representation of only 16 cube times 64 channels uh, because to be honest, that's how much I can fit into my machine. Um, but you can go bigger than that. But I think even if with such a small footprint of spatial resolution, it can still capture a lot of information of this indoor scene, which uh, I think in terms of disentangled representation goes, it's the first time that we can uh, fully disentangle the pose from the room on this date, on such a complicated data set. Um, so what have uh, adding this inductive biases do to our GAN model? And I would argue that just by adding this knowledge, which is very trivial to us, right, like the world's 3D, okay, um, the model 
can just to add in this extra knowledge, you can now generate images with arguably better image qualities. So you can capture a lot more than just a white background. You can have uh, the model can have a better 3D understanding, so you can now can freely rotate around the object and generate images out of it. And we can now also have a disentangled representation. So within this latent representation, uh, you can now factorize out the pose and the appearance and the shape, and not just like a um, entangled representation anymore. Um, so yeah, that is the end of my talk. Thank you.